hey, welcome to Red River podcast number 107. Uh, man, long time coming, man. Uh, I've been friends with this dude for a minute. Wanted to do a one on one. Uh, Mike Terry, Jukebox Romantics, got a new record out, had some shows, some that you played, some that got canceled. So what's going on? <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> what's going on? We're doing this the day after Christmas and it feels good to be doing something. I've been fucking quarantined for 10 days or almost 10 days. Uh, yeah, man, we got a record. We played some shows. We got COVID and canceled the show. Yeah. So, how, uh, how, many, how many did you play? Uh, we did three out of the four. Okay. And not the, bad. No, not bad. I just fucking pissed, man. The big one was was uh, so back up a little bit. We were supposed to do like a whole week with Piebald, uh, a band that I like one record. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know much about Piebald other than that one record. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Same, same. And it's a great record. And yeah. they they have like their bass and they were playing cool venues and they always played cool venues. And I think um. I was like, oh, they seem like a really fun band. Like every time I saw videos of them playing, I was like, oh, this would be a fun band. Like definitely like, I don't know if we fit in with them, but it's whatever. So one day um, I'm on like the fest, like message board kind of thing on Facebook. Like it's called like fest friends, like the fest, the music festival, the fest uh, down in Gainesville. And uh, the, this guy posts in there and he was like, oh, um, check out my podcast. It's called two weeks notice and he interviews bands and they're all like from like in the realm of like Thursday and every time I die and that whole genre of, of like post hardcore from the two thousands. And he was supposed to be a fest and uh, he is the tour manager for Pieball. Oh, so I just hit him up. I was just like, Oh, I heard you guys were touring. He's like, yeah, I'd love to get you on the whole week. You know, but cool. So then, you know, cause of COVID uh, all the local promoters didn't want, to put on like another touring band, which I totally get, you know, they're like, Oh, the shows aren't pre-selling well, blah, blah, blah. We want to have like strong locals on all of them. So it looked like we were going to get on uh, the New York show. And then it was like, ah, we'll put you on the, uh, the Philly show. Cause New York had like Nathan gray from uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Voices fire and, and uh, fucking Mikey Erg yep. from every band. And um so, uh, so, like, yeah, we'll play Philly. It'd be great. It'll be a nice little end to our like record release weekend. And then, you know, Saturday night, we played this fucking insane basement show in the Bronx, which is like, it, is that the one that, that I played with you guys? No, no. Okay. I so I thought it was going to be because okay. I, I hadn't been to this place. So this place was called the Foxhole. And basically there's this promoter called the Fox and the King. They basically run like the Bronx underground for the last like 10 years. And, uh, they turn their basement or it's like almost like a living room, but it's the basement into a venue. It was like good sound. We got somebody who emailed us. who was like, what is your lighting design? I was like, for the fucking basement. What's the yeah. lighting design? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yo, so what, I could have sworn that. So I remember we played with you guys in a basement in the Bronx. And right. I, I could have sworn that's where it was. No, no, no. So this the, I think the basement that we played together was called like Paul something's house. Okay. There's some guy named Paul. This was a different guy. And I don't even know if it was his house or his parents' house or who it was, but this was like the most professional basement operation I've ever played. And we've done a ton of basement shows. We did a whole tour of like mostly basement shows and some more professional than others. This one was like, they were checking vaccines. They were doing temperature yeah. checks. They wow. had masks. They had masks for people. They had fucking sound lights. They had like a, like they had banners and shit. They were like a photographer was there. Like they were like, legit about it we Omic had merch set up o o omicron was like i don't give a fuck i'm getting through everyone <laughs> oh yeah so <laughs> hmm. so we fucking do this basement show and like i would say about like 90 percent of the people are wearing masks but we're in a fucking basement yeah. and uh our bass player was like i don't feel so good i think my neck hurts it's like, okay i'm like i'm just feeling tired you know like uh we haven't really done anything since fest we haven't really done a run since before covid we've only done like a couple shows over the summer this is like four days in a row. I'm like, I'm a new dad. It's like, you know, I'm out of shape. I'm like, I'm probably just tired. And he's like, I'm probably just tired too. And then like the next day, he's like, I'm sick. And we were on our way to Philly. And we we're like, all right, like go get a test at your house. He had a test luckily. And like, we'll drive in the van. And if you're positive, we'll just turn around because we were, you know, around you. But if you're negative and you just have a cold, like we'll just play the show without you. And 
AJ, our new guitarist, will play bass and we'll do it as a three piece. Wow. And okay. so we were like an at, we were by like fucking giant stadium. And he like called us. He's like, I'm positive. I'm like, OK, cool. Then we turned around, turned you know? around. Yeah. And, and we it- were not the only band that like there was another band called Goalkeeper. Um, they were awesome band. They dropped, too, because of COVID. And then this is like, you know, we were like the start of like this whole Christmas week of everybody getting sick. Everyone did. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, did, were your symptoms that bad? Yeah, I was pretty bad Monday and Tuesday. I was like two days. I basically had the flu. Okay. Um, uh, and then just like being real tired. I was up in the attic. I was like quarantining up there with a space heater. I have a newborn and my my uh, partner, she's a pediatrician fighting COVID. So like she hasn't gotten COVID in like two years. And she's like, I'm going to have fucking COVID at home because you you know played a bunch of shows. Yeah. Uh, so uh, but no, they didn't get sick. And uh, I'm like at the end of my quarantine, I'm just tired. But it's what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, well, listen, I mean, whatever. Uh, you, you got three out of the four. Uh, the fourth one would have been awesome. Um, but you got the new record out. And uh, it took a minute for, for, for this new record to come out, right? Why? Uh, it took a minute because we started writing it at the end of 2019 and recording it then. And then we went in with the idea of doing like 12, uh, doing like a full record. And we were going to, we had like half of it done. And the idea was like, let's just do five now. And like, we had like seven or eight that were like still being mostly worked out. We're like, well, let's just start with five. And like, maybe we'll come in and do the other five. Cause we didn't want to spend a ton of money at once. And yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. No, believe me, you're preaching to the choir on that. But that's not like how we ever did things. We always were like, all right, we're going to do like 10 bangers. And like, maybe we'll do 12 and keep 10. And we'll just go in and do it all in like two weeks. But, you know, we noticed that like, we, we were working with John DeClary up in Nada um, and he's up in Montgomery, New York. And he kind of got his start uh, in his mom's basement doing like autopilot off and, and brand new. He did brand new's first record. He did autopilot off. And then he started doing shit like um, he did anthrax. He did my chemical romance, a bunch of shit for them. Wow. Um, and a lot of pop punk stuff like that. So we, you know, we roll with him for the last like record and then we love the way he produces so we're like let's do it like let's do it with him again and we got there and we thought our songs were ready to go and he's like yo what are you doing like this is the chorus and this is the verse and and he never really did that before with us our other our last record sleepwalk he was kind of less like oh this is great and like a couple things here or there like but it wasn't really like he was really part of the process yeah this he was like yo like we should have done pre-production we've never done pre-production before we just fucking go for it yeah. and uh <laughs> and we're like yeah I, I, got- I learned i learned later on that pre-production is pretty important uh um, yeah I, it just I, seemed I like learned. another expensive step of, you know and it's also like depends on who you're working with like he's a, a really good producer so it makes sense you know yeah yeah, uh, yeah. And so we wind up like rewriting a couple things in the studio and it took longer than it wanted to. So we only got the five songs done musically and we're like, all right, like we'll come back and start doing vocals. And we got most of the vocals done and then COVID hit. And so we were out of the studio. His father actually died of COVID. Wow. Uh, So he was being really protective of coming into the studio. And by summer 2020, we kind of got back together and we were supposed to record. And then there was shit going on with the band internally. Um, with like just being professional and being like prepared and we had studio time booked and it got canceled. And then we had studio time booked again and I got canceled. And every time I got canceled, we lost a grand. Mm. So, we, and we were just hemorrhaging money because during the pandemic, you know, we weren't playing shows and we were a band that plays a lot of shows and that's kind of how we make money selling t-shirts. Yeah. And so I could only sell so many online t-shirts. <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of just burned our money and then, we had like a breakup of the band, kind of. Uh, I mean, I've never really said it out loud like that, but it was kind of just like either either you're going to leave or we're going to be done or it can't continue the way it is kind of thing or I'm going to leave because it's not fun. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and clearly like if and my and my whole thing from the beginning of Jukebox was like we we're a band to, to travel, make friends, make fans of our music, have fun, see new places set goals, do new things, do cool things and just have fun. And if it's not fun, then don't do it because it doesn't make enough money for it to yeah. not be fun. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I have fun doing it. Like I, I, I treat it very professional, our band, even though it's like basically an expensive hobby. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, it you is. Know, <laughs> yeah, man. it's like I treat it like a business because it is one, but it's yeah. also a hobby and it's my passion and I love it. So if you're not going to be the same level of passion or at least remotely 
half of, of my work ethic, then like, you know, like maybe it's not the right project for you because maybe, uh, I don't know, like if you're not having, uh, it really comes down to if you're not having fun. And if you're not having fun, it becomes too much of a job. It's not worth it because it doesn't make enough money for it to be a job. Or to, yeah, exactly. It's it's basically, you know, like preaching to the choir for me, for sure, where it's like uh, as soon as someone new comes in and it's it, there's like friction, uh, I, I I immediately try to cut it out because it's like um, kind of like turns things into not being fun. And like you said, it's like if we're not having fun doing this, then there is no point because it's like we're all we're doing is playing music and, and we love it and we don't want to stop, you know. So once like you, uh, an element happens where it's like it doesn't become fun or you have to like, you know, uh, maybe I, I don't know your situation, but I'm talking about in general, like babysit or like or. Oh, I mean, that's what it was. I mean, we got yeah. to a point where we were touring internationally and, and doing big you know, support tours. And it was like, you know, we hired two people to be a, a, a tech and a, a merch person and to help with driving. And they basically became 12 hour shift babysitters. Somebody takes the first half and somebody takes the other half. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't fun at that point. Like, you know, uh, I was not having fun and, you know, somebody's missing shows because like they're too fucked up or they got too fucked up the day before. And you know what, to be honest, like now that they're not in the band anymore, like we're better friends, they're still playing music yeah. and they weren't, and they honestly weren't getting, you know, um, what they wanted out of the band anyway. They're, uh, we're talking about Bobby edge here. We might as well talk about it. Like Bobby is a way better musician than I am when it comes to playing guitar or bass or anything. So him, him playing bass, which is not his main instrument. And he's playing it like a fucking madman. You know, when he's writing music, for our band, I can't play it on guitar. I'm not that good of a guitar player. I can write songs like a motherfucker. I cannot play guitar. Hey, so, me, me and you both, right? You know, and and we try, <laughs> and we tried in the past to get other guitar players in the band or other musicians so that somebody be like, hey, do you want to play bass so that Bob can play guitar? You know, but yeah. it never worked out. We had we had a million fucking guitarists, but nobody can play bass that well. Or if they could, they couldn't do the touring that we wanted to do or be, you know, all the things we just mentioned before, like the professionalism or yeah. have the same sort of goals in mind. Cause you know, you gotta be somewhat on the same page. I remember, um, I remember when you guys got Bobby, well, it was just really at that point, it was just you and Mike. Um, and once I heard Bobby, I was like, wow, I'm like, this guy is really, really good. <laughs> He's yeah, like, yeah. And, and don't get know. me wrong. Like Mike, our original bass player is fucking savage at bass. Um, Bob just has like a different like sexiness the way he plays bass and you know Bob I can sing vocally vocally yeah, is what I yeah. meant yeah vocally Bob could sing yeah. before before Bob was in the band it was basically just me nobody else and like they'll admit it like nobody else can really sing in jukebox even our original singer he had a very unique style of singing it was his voice you know for our first record first two records but there was besides me nobody else could sing with him so once he was out of the band it was kind of just me and besides gang vocals and stuff, like there was nobody doing harmonies on records but me. And it was nice that once we started writing with Bob, like he could sing. And now with the new dudes, they both can sing. So now it's like, yeah, those two have... guys are, are uh, definitely ringers for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're and they're both multi instrumentalists and they come from different worlds of, of, of music than like, you know, than I do. You know, they're younger. They come from more of a pop punk and like hardcore scene. And they, so they write differently. And so, uh, and they can sing and uh, it's, it's cool because it kind of like just grows on what we were doing, which is the whole point. I don't want to regress. No, no. I mean, yeah. hey, listen for, for a band like us, just like you guys, you know, we, we were kind of like, uh, you know, we went along. I feel like we're, we're like parallel and to see you guys from where you started to where you are now it's like, it's pretty amazing. Like the evolution, you know? So like I got to see all of it. So I, I love it. And for this record in particular. Um, so, so basically Bobby like was a co-writer and all this stuff. And then these guys just play it live. Is that what happened on? Yeah. So yeah, Bob. So then Bob and I like, and, and Norm, like it kind of just chilled out and AJ started playing with us. And actually my stepbrother started playing bass and then uh, it just didn't work out. So then we found James. And then when 2021 hit, you know, we had to go back and I was like, yo, let's just finish these five songs. Fuck it being like, you know, a record. Like, let's just finish what we started 
And I think like tensions had cooled. So it was like, yeah, like it won't be that weird. Like Bob, just come finish what you started. And, uh, and so I finished all my shit. Bob came in and finished some stuff and changed things that they originally were going to be. And uh, it was great. We kind of like finished it and it was a nice like, like end cap to like what he did. And like he finished writing everything that he was writing and uh, we were all really happy with it. And if we weren't, we weren't going to release it. So we loved it. So that was it. So the, these new dudes, James and AJ, they learned 20 old songs and these five new ones. And uh, and then like right around there, we we started like shopping it out um, because that's just what we do. So we were doing that and uh, sell the heart records, picked up the record. Um, we, it was between them and working with uh, say 10 records who I love Adam. And uh, you know what? After our last record experience uh, with Sleepwalk, we released that on paper and plastic. It was like somewhat of a disaster, which we we had heard horror tales before. But we were like, oh, but it's this dude. And like they have this sort of clout and like maybe we'll get this and that out of it. And like you kind of weigh the pros and cons like it'll be different with us. And uh, it wasn't. And it was a disaster. And we we're like, fuck it. Like next record, especially because this is an EP. Like, let's just work with somebody we know. And we knew yeah. Andy, Andy from Sell the Heart. Uh, he's from Tsunami Bomb also. And it was nice to be like able to work with like somebody that we know is a good dude. Yeah, he's, uh, he's he, he was on the show. Oh, yeah, he did. Uh, he was on for our Smashing Pumpkins episode. Oh, fuck. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, you know, yeah. him. I mean, like he's like a solid, yeah. genuine dude. It'd be like doing a record with you. Like if you were like, oh, like I got a record label. I want to put out your record. I'm like, OK, cool. I yeah. know you. I can trust you. I know people who know you. Everybody who knew the last label we worked at, it was nothing but bad news. But it was just like, oh, a name. And like that's kind of how I look at record labels anyway. There's two ways to look at them. It's either you're signing with a record label because they're going to put you on X, Y, and Z tours. And because people all of a yeah. sudden will give more shit about your band because it's your record label. I mean, we know tons of people. We have tons of friends like the signed to a bigger label. Nobody gave a shit about their band before, or they had somewhat of a small fan base, but because they're on a bigger label now, or this label, people are like, Oh, I should pay attention to this band. That is the only reason to sign with a label at this point is if they're going to give you cool tours and name recognition. Other than that, I'm signing with a label because they're good dudes who are going to bankroll something and they, they trust that like they'll make their money back and then like break even or make some money and it'll just be a fun artistic passion project. So there's two schools of thought. At least that's the way I'm looking at it. You know, I, people ask me all the time, like, oh, how do I sign to a label? How do I do this? I'm like, well, what the fuck do you want out of it? Are you trying yeah, what to do, what do you want out of it? Yeah, for sure. Because you know? like when, when we talk to like Andy uh, from Sell the Heart, like I, I talked to him about our last two EPs and it's just like, I'm so, you know, part of me is so self-deprecating where I'm thinking like who, like no one would give a shit if we were on a label anyway. And on top of that, like, I don't like asking people, I don't like waiting. If I get a record, I'm going to put it up. Like to me, like, I don't want to like, the part of like the well, you're like, also not like a vinyl person, right? Like we're not. Yeah, we're not. vinyl. Yeah. So like but like the idea of it was cool. And I like Andy and like I like what he does. So like part of me, like the last two times I'm like, oh, maybe we'll do it. And then like every single time I'm like, ah, oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> you know, and and I don't know, you know, maybe it's it it, it would turn out awesome. You know, it's, it's just like for us, the, what I want out of it is to get new eyes, you know, like he's uh, based out of, uh, you know, on the West Coast. So maybe that'll help people from that side. Like we just played shows like we just played a show in Jersey with uh, the, the Taking Back Sunday show. And like people from Jersey were like, you know, like totally loving us, but they would never have known that we like some dude wrote a review. He's like, I never even heard. <laughs> dude, dude, but that's dude, that's the thing, dude. I, and so fucking like I say this all the time because like, I, we've been a band since 2008 and like I'm the only original dude and Norm's been in the band since 2012. And so, you know, this, cause how old is your band at this point? Yeah. Same. So, okay. So like people, you know, I remember when we were on altercation records, they had a great idea. They were like, if you tour as much as jukebox tours in the first year, everybody should know who you are in your region. In the first five years, everybody should know on your coast who you are. And in 10 years, everybody in the country should know who you are uh, or at least have, have name recognition. Right. And then I was like, that's a great thing. And kind of true, depending on how much you tour, you know, with the internet, it's a little bit different now because people can know you just yeah, from the internet. Very however, now. Yeah. however, like I'm still like, there are still people in our general area, even in our county, because we don't really play here that much or in New York City 
or whatever, we'll play a show with X band, like a band that we don't normally play with, or like an old school band, like we play with the Addicts at Gramercy, or we'll play with like somebody at, at Knitting Factory, and they'll be like, Oh my God, your band's fucking awesome. How have I never heard you? I was like, yeah. I don't fucking know. You've been a band for 13 years. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You, t- you tell me, because I don't know how people find music. I find music the way I find music is because Spotify or somebody told me yeah. or because I go to shows. But for people who go to different levels of shows, which is like, I go to A, local shows, B, like DIY shows, big shows, stadium shows. Some people, like, especially in the punk rock world of things will be like, Oh, I only go see where rancid when they come around. So unless you were like going to see rancid, you would maybe like, Oh, I just heard of this new band, the interrupters, which are not like a small band, you know, like they play. No, a no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's like, you yeah. know, like they're a put together band. Like it's one of those things where it's like some people only discover new music based on where they're going to find new music. And so you can always find new people to find your music. And if you make a fan, one fan at a time, like, that's cool. I mean, at least to me, like it depends on what you're looking. It really depends on what you want out of life and what you want to do. And I just want to play cool shows and travel and tour. And yeah, like maybe me and our band's goals have changed over time, but that's like a good thing because bands are fucking like roller coasters. You have fucking super highs and then you plateau and then you go big and small. And like, that's just like part of the journey. You just have to enjoy it. If you're really trying to hit like, hit like a destination playing music or like making art is like a weird way of doing that because it's it's all about the process. And and if you don't enjoy the process of doing it or mm. or just like in general, like the ebbs and flows of it, yeah. then like you're definitely going to be disappointed the whole time because, you know, I could speak on us. And sorry, I had lots of coffee and I've been inside all week. So I'm rambling. Yeah, but no, I, do I, a ramble. I, I can speak on us personally. And like at this point, you know, like my, my our drummer, Mike Norman, when we went and, and Bob was the same way when we had. You know, they joined the band after we had done like the warp tours and the fest the first time. So we had done like warp tours and had and been on these compilations and got like this taste of whatever somebody would consider some sort of success, you know, which is like totally a thought in your mind of whatever success is, which whatever you want it to be. Oh, it's true though. Um, we we're like, oh, that's cool. And then like, you know, we had the dippers, like, oh yeah, we didn't get put on the tour this year, or we didn't get on fest this year, or we didn't get on Pooza or we didn't do the things that we wanted to do, but we still had goals to get on them or do cooler things. When we got on that face to face, less than Jake tour. Yeah. You know, we're, we're playing in front of like a thousand people every night. Hell yeah. And, and like, awesome. it was fucking awesome. And you know, for them, that was their first, like, besides like doing some cool support shows in the city, like, and playing big venues here where we live, it was like their first taste of like a national touring thing and playing like on big stages every day in front of big crowds and like an actual opportunity to win people over every day um, and make new fans. Mind you, that's in a very small demographic of people who are already jaded, who aren't looking for new bands. So when you're playing with like these legacy bands, like a less than Jake and face to face, most people going to that show are not going for the opening bands. Some young people who are into less than Jake, because they create new fans based off their fans, having kids, um, they might be into you, but like most people are not there to see the opening band. Um, and you could probably contest to that because you just played with a band. That's a legacy band at this point, you know, where it's like you made some new fans, but most people are coming for like the headliner. Oh you know? yeah. Yeah. So Bob and Norm got that taste of like this cool shit. And then after that, it was like, we're never doing another tour that doesn't have fucking like, you know, where we don't get catering or we don't get this or that, or like, you know, like decent money or something, because at the same time we had just done Europe. We had just done Europe and Europe touring. Europe is way different than touring America. And we do Europe all the time now because it's just, you get treated better over there. And I'm sure every motherfucker who's ever played Europe will tell you this on this podcast or in general, like it's just different over there. The music is, is our style of music is accepted more over there. It's more popular over there. So and because of that, you're just treated better over there. It's just the way it is. So they got that taste of success. When we came back, it was like, ah, oh, I don't want to do anything that's not cool like that. And that's really hard to do because it's always about like what you're going to do next. And so if there's nothing lined up next or something falls through or a fucking pandemic happens or this and that happens, like you kind of lose any sort of momentum. And that's just how bands are. Yeah, that's literally how a lot of things are acting, any form of artist or popularity. It comes in ebbs and flows. Look at fucking the Gaslight Anthem. That is a band that blew up on their second record. And then you're trying to sustain that. It's not going to happen, you know, and, and, and you just take what you can get and enjoy like the 
little festival you get thrown on or like the support show. And if you get like another tour, that's fucking awesome. But like, I don't know. I think that's why I'm a big firm believer in like stopping and appreciating the things you're doing while you're doing them. Cause you don't know if you get to do them again. So no. that's why it's about enjoying the trip instead of like where you're going and what's next, because there might not be something cool next or there might be something cool next, but not on like the same level. Same level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we uh, the, like the last four shows we did, like it was like Irving Plaza, uh, two sold out Mulcahy's and then Starland. And for us, we're thinking yeah. like we're like, OK, mentally, I'm thinking like this is as big as it's ever going to get. So everyone here, I'm like, enjoy these four shows because I don't know, no, maybe this will never happen again. I have no idea. So that's how we looked at it. We're like we were like tourists for those four shows being like, cool, no one's here to see us, but you know, we're here. We're just happy to be here. And, and our job was to basically take this opportunity and crush just so people, um, you know, now with the internet, man, that was the difference between like when, you know, when we started in 07 or you did in 08, like if you didn't hit the road, you weren't reaching anyone. Now right. it's a little different now. Like I feel like it, since 2018, once I decided I wanted to open up an Instagram for the band, I was like, you know what? I'm going to constantly create shit. I'm going to put clips up. I'm going to put live stuff. I'm going to put uh, total content nonstop to basically be in everyone's face that eventually somebody will be like, oh, I know this band, whatever, you know, and, and I feel like you could have that presence now with things like Spotify, totally. you know, I mean, that's what AJ, our new guitarist, he blew up. He on is, TikTok. he is amazing at that. He is so he, good. Yeah. But the thing is like, you have to like doing that shit. He likes doing that stuff. So yeah. he's like, oh, it's so easy to create a TikTok. You do this, this, and this. And like, you just have to have a stupid idea. And a lot of it is so dumb, <laughs> but if you like it, if you like doing it, that's great. But like, yeah. you know, you'll get, you'll get, you know, followers from it. But like, but then I, but then I look at it and I say, well, Hey, how many of these people are showing up to see you play? Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. how many of these people are turning it into dollars? Yeah. He's like, well, that's the thing. Like you don't ask anybody to buy anything until you really need them to buy something. So if you have 400,000 people following you and you never, and you just give them free content all the time, that one time you ask them, Hey, can you, can I'm looking to sell this, you know, fund a record. If you get a thousand of those people, that's funds your record out of 400,000. And, and I think the hard part about it is unlike YouTube where you can monetize it, it's really hard to make money off of TikTok because you have to send people to somewhere else to spend their money. And they're already getting everything they need from you from there. You know, no one is going there to listen to music. You might get new fans and followers, but yeah. like, how are you? How does it turn into somebody coming to your show? A couple of people might come out and do one or two people's one or two people. Like who cares? Yeah. Like, I mean, it depends on what you want. You know, it really depends on what you're looking to do with your music. And when it comes to bands like us, or at least our band, if I wanted to make money off of doing this, I would play a different style of music. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you know, we play punk rock. Like yeah, pop yeah. punk. It's like, it's like how many bands in our genre really break through? And if they do, there's something really cool about them. We're on four white dudes playing music that sounds like other people's music already. Like, there's not, <laughs> you know, like there's nothing cool or special about us. Like, you know, there's there's nothing like sexy about us. It's like we're four white dudes, like ranging from 25 to 40. Like, yeah. you know, like like that's like there's not there's what is there? And I'm really underselling our band right now. But, no, no, but like, I, but like you know, what I'm saying like there's you it's all about the song at that point and if people like to come to shows so yeah, it's all about the song and the thing that our two bands share um you know especially you guys live you guys even if someone doesn't know jukebox romantics live like once you see you guys play it's like immediately pleasing to the ear it's not like you guys are like napalm death it's not like you guys are like some like niche thing like uh the songs are no 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 and i know that there's something special about our band because after all these years no matter what Every show we play, somebody, at least one person, if not more, will always come up to me and be like, hey, like this is not a backhand compliment to anybody else. But like the other bands were like they were playing a gig and it was really good. But like you put on a show yeah. and I don't consider us a gimmick band at all. Like there's nothing no. gimmicky about us. I don't we don't fucking wear costumes or masks. And I'm all about a good gimmick. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but like but like <laughs> if, like. You know, like we are just a band. And so like I like to play music and entertain and I let the music speak for itself. But also like 
I don't like, it's not just staring at people playing music. There's something, you know, our songs may be catchy, but putting on a show is part of it. And that's, and I like to entertain and play music. Like I am not somebody who lives in the studio or loves writing music all the time. So playing is, you know, very important to me. And I think, you know, to go back to something that you just said before, when you were talking about the shows you just played with, and you were telling your band members like, Hey, like, you know, enjoy this because, you know, we don't know, blah, 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 blah. I literally said that last Saturday at our show in the basement, live into a microphone. I was like, Hey, everybody, I want you guys all to have the best time ever tonight because fucking tomorrow isn't guaranteed no matter what. And guess what? Tomorrow wasn't guaranteed. Yeah. Our show tomorrow didn't happen. And I told that to all of our band members, like, yo, fucking play this shit like your fucking life depends on it, because we just had two years of not playing any music and yeah. it could happen again tomorrow. And that's exactly what happens. So bringing and it down to a very small level of just like as musicians and as a band, like just fucking enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy the process and just, I don't know, fucking do the, it as the, best as you can. The process is still a, a big thing for me. Like, um, you know, when you have a really killer verse and you're trying to get that chorus chord change and it happens like to me, like I think about it all day. Like if I'm at work, that that chord changes in my head and I'm like trying combinations just mentally, like being yeah. like, oh, maybe I'll try this. And once you get it, like that process is still a big deal. Like once once that right chorus or that right melody hits, you're just like, this is like I think at, at, at above anything, that's still the joy that I get is to basically still be able to construct a song because once I'm done, yeah, but are writing, you guys constructing as a, is it just you or are you guys collectively constructing now? Not just me. <laughs> okay. So that's like a huge difference though. Cause like I've never, so there, yeah, there's been songs that we wrote that were like just me and I consider them my songs, even though like we put them together collectively as a band, but I I find joy out of writing by writing something and then seeing what everybody else brings into it because I don't have the talent to do what I want to do on it. So I'm like, let's see what these people can bring to it. However, I will be the first person to be like, nah, it should be like this because this is what the hook is. And it's tough because I have a drummer who is severely, um, he is very hyper aware of what people think of songs and his drumming. Like, and so he writes everything at the standpoint of the drummer. And I have to always stop him and be like, Hey, 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 hey. it's all about the song and not about the drums. Cause in the end, like, yes, when we're playing live, everybody is watching you because yeah. everybody loves watching the drummer. No matter well, what band it is, you love watching the drummer, but he's an animal though. Like I like watching bass players and, uh -huh. and cause I think it's awesome. Uh, but like people, most people who are just like regular music listeners or your average concert goer, they will watch the lead singer and the drummer. And so he is hyper aware of that. And he's hyper aware of that. Like he's always pushing himself to be better. I've never seen somebody get better at their instrument quicker and faster than he has over the years. When he joined the band, I would tell you he sucked at drums. <laughs> he had never been in a real band before. He could barely stay on time. Wow. And now he's insanely good. Yeah. So when we're writing music, I have to be like, hey, you know, like I want to see Mike Norman come through on this song. Like when I listen to Blink-182, I know if it's Travis Barker playing it, but I don't need to be distracted by the drums. You know, when, when, when it's live, it's a different story and blah, 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 blah. But if I'm writing a song like Hey Nora or Bite the Neck, it is about the song. And I don't give a fuck what your drums are doing. If your drums or something is in the way of what makes a song catchy, then it needs to change. And it's really hard to do that when you when you approach music as a collective, because I always want to make people feel like they're part of what we're doing, because that's what's so cool about it is creating music. I love creating music with other people. And if it's not a fun process or if something's not working, you know, that's that's the joy of it. And that's kind of what we're going through right now with the new dudes is we have songs that we started writing with Bob, you know, in 2019. And then we have new songs we're writing with them. And it's nice to hear what they bring to the old songs, but it's also cool to write new songs with them because they come from a different realm of things, but it still will sound like jukebox in some form. And I, if you go back and listen to our first records to now, there is a progression of sound, but it still does sound like the same band. And I think that's important. I love when bands sound different on every record, but I love that it still sounds like them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to do. Yeah. You know? <laughs> or if you're a band, like say a band that we both love, like face to face, they could write the same record 10 times and I won't care because they're really good at writing that song. Yeah. Yeah. They, you know what I'm saying? 
If you can write th- three good songs, you just need to write them three different ways. You know, do you like uh, the new record? The new face to face record? Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I think it sounds like a face to face record. I couldn't tell you if I love it or not because I listened to it twice because it sounded like a face to face record. There's no songs that I was like, man, I got to listen to this again, where I feel like I'm protection. I listen to it a lot. Oh, protection like, was killer. And protection I think this was record solid. What like protection immediately as soon as I heard it for sure. Uh, this one definitely is more of a grower. Yeah, and I think I think I, I think I dug it. I think his songwriting is like, you know, been solid forever. Um, and I think his his vocals sound great. You know, uh, and just seeing them recently with Bouncing Souls, it was probably the best I had seen him play ever. Better oh, than really? yeah, better than we were on tour with them. He sounded great. He was sounded good. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, nothing really stuck in my brain is like this. I, like, I couldn't tell you one song off it right now. And I listened to it a bunch. Yeah. So I think it was solid, but I don't know. It didn't stick with me Yeah. this yeah. year. I was weird with music right. for me. Like, uh, I got into like, like weird shit this year. Like I like mod <laughs> son. I started listening to mod son. Oh, uh, you sent so me that weird. song. So you sent me that song, uh, karma, right? So, yeah. um, that made my um you know so i make my favorite hip hop records of the of the year uh i make my favorite um rock records of the year specifically for the podcast so we're going to yeah work. yeah yeah um and then there's singles there's so- certain songs that are probably just singles that came out in 2021 or also songs off of albums that i didn't entirely love but i really love those songs and i played them a lot and and karma was one of those songs where i was like this is definitely a top 20 single of the year for me yeah and, and you know like i because of that song and because of that that producer and finding out that him and John Feldman were writing everybody's music right now. Oh, they are. Yeah. John yeah. Feldman is insane. Mod son and, and young blood and, and John Feldman were doing, you know, all of machine gun Kelly, all of these like Travis Barker songs, Travis Barker's producing all of them also. And by that, I mean, he's probably just playing drums on all of them, but um, you know, uh, there's all these like artists coming out, dropping singles and they're all produced by those guys. And just seeing the trends of music, I I keep battling with myself. And I've actually, you know, part of the writing process, I've been like our battling with Norman, our drummer about it, because it's basically our band and AJ and James just joined it. They're in the band, but, you know, it's me and Norm's band. Um, we, you know, we've gone back and forth with arguing about like writing and what are we writing for? Because the way I write music was like, oh, hey, we want to put out a record. Let's start writing for a record. I would love to write a record in, in a month or two months. Like, you know, I'd love to be one of those bands that go into the studio and write a record because I feel like you can rewrite something too many times. And if something's not good, it's not good. However, the state of music today, everything is about singles. It's all singles. And that's kind of how we released the new record. Yeah, yeah. We rele- it we was, a good, it was a good good rollout. Well, and part of that was because of the bullshit that's going on with vinyl records right now. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The vinyl record was supposed to come out right before Halloween, which would have been great when it comes to like being on year end lists and right before festivals and all that sort of shit, like it would have been great. But because of the delay in vinyl, we were like, okay, let's start releasing a song a month in August. And so by December, if the record's delayed, we had just released almost all the songs off the EP and it worked out perfectly like that. However, because it got released on December 17th, it gets like forgotten about on like any year end list. Yep, People yep. haven't listened to it yet. And then by next week, it's already a year old. You're right. Which is like, <laughs> which is like, which is like a curse of jukebox. That's happened with us, like with two records now. So that my idea now is like, well, what's the point? Like, why don't like it costs so much money to make a record. It costs so much money to produce a record. There's now a three year delay in vinyl. Why don't we just start writing fucking singles? Like, let's go fucking write a song, demo it out, maybe write a few songs, demo out, and then, you know, pre-production it, go to a studio, record one fucking song, and then, like, really push that song. And, you know, I get it because we're old people who like to listen to albums, and people still like to listen to albums. I don't give a fuck what anybody says about how music is released. Albums are still albums. But, like, we do live in a world where, like, you can just write a banger song and that's it. Like, why do you need a whole album? And you, and you're a perfect example because you're a writing machine. So you'll write music all the time and you can release EPs or singles all yeah. the time. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, that's that's because like like I told you, um, you know, for a band that doesn't tour, like if we toured or played as much as you guys did, you know, pandemic out of the equation, um, it makes sense. You know, you release a record, you could play these songs. If you have 10 songs and you you do like 100 out of town shows a year you're playing to other people but for us it's like we play mr beery's once a month it's like okay it's like i'm gonna release 10 songs most people are gonna be like eh you know so i'm like let's do four or five at a time uh because i'm asking you for 15 minutes of your time for the next six months and then from there uh the the music videos also helped a lot i thought you know oh that, totally that, i think music videos are are, are... It Great. helped us. Yeah. It helped us yeah. get out there a lot. People kind of like saw us in a different light. Uh, the consistency. Um, and yeah, to me, like that, that's how I looked at it, which, which is what I, I really love about the, you know, fires forming. Like there's it's 16, 16 and a half minutes. And uh, I mean, you got to be happy with the way this record sounds. This fucking sounds amazing. The Oh, dude, track. I fucking I love the fucking record. And like the it's great. It's cool. It's cool to see like where shit's going and it's cool to like dude like it came out beautiful like everybody who's vinyl people like they fucking love the way it was pressed and the different gorgeous. colors came out great yep. gorgeous and the artwork was great um and it just looks awesome and i was and we we're like fucking psychos like who puts five songs on a fucking 12 inch like we just we put five songs on one side of a 12 inch because i was like nobody likes 10 inches and they cost us as much to make and we didn't want to do a seven inch because i hate seven inches because who sits there and flips a record every two minutes like it was like one of those things I was like, let's just put it on this. And we knew that the profit margins were so small on it. We could only sell it for so much. Yeah. But I was like, fuck it. Who cares? Like, it's already been like two years since we started like writing it. Like, let's just make it fucking awesome and release it the way it is. And it'll be cool. And, you know, it, and, and I love it. And I think every song is a banger and every song's different. Yet, you know, I saw a review the other day that was like, I've never heard five songs on an EP that felt like an album. Like it starts somewhere and ends somewhere. And it has like a... A five very different stories but they all kind of work together and they're kind of bookended where it yeah. like starts with like an anthem a political anthem and ends with like a self-reflective fucking you know whatever it is like a journey song and i think not like the band journey like <laughs> take you on a bit, uh, take you on a journey uh should have been gone yeah we just lost half the audience <laughs> after Fuck. you said that i said no more <laughs> teeth, very psychos uh, <laughs> but like the end of castaway is super cool too like that very ending like it's just very like uh frantic and uh yeah it's all five songs like very different especially what the uh, dying like we, we had the discussion about the the middle track right oh dying flies the yeah. like the hardcore pop punk yeah song in seven eight yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> three yeah it's in seven eight yeah it's in seven it's in seven yeah seven eight time I don't, I don't know much about that stuff i know six eight that's it i don't know yeah no eight. seven eight it's like one two three four five six seven one two it's like it's a weird the one is on this. It was it's fucking impossible. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I just don't think about it. It's like the breakdown part. It sounds like a New York hardcore part, but it's in seven, eight. Nobody would ever know unless you count. It's, no. it's weird. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, to me, like uh, we, we had a song called Wish and, and my friends like I love that six, eight shit. And I was like, uh, I guess I don't know what that means, but <laughs> yeah, it's like a waltz. It's yeah, like a yeah, waltz. It's, it's a waltz. Yeah. For, and, and like I as much as I know about music, there's a bunch of shit that I don't know. And I'm just no, like, I mean, that's I'm in the same level. You know, it's like, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I just I just pick up and play like I don't really know. I mean, that, and that's the thing, like being having AJ and James in the band now, like, uh, a, a, you know, AJ went to school for music and is a music teacher. So when we're writing and he'll be like, it's not that note because of music theory and bullshit. I'm like, yeah, whatever sounds good. Sounds good. My man. <laughs> like, that's it. Yeah. You know? And that's the thing. Like, I'm like, I trust whatever you're doing. And like, if it sounds cool, like, yeah, that's it. That's it. But like, you know, I think our ears are the best judge. If it sounds cool or if it's, if it's a cool part, like we'll know it's cool. If it sounds like shitty, like, then, you know, like, I don't well, think you need to know music theory to know that a long time ago. Like uh, when, uh, you know, we had a guitarist named Tom, he was in the band and I was writing a song called places and I was trying to teach it to him. And there was like this like a uh, seventh note and he was just like confused by it because he, he he's a way better guitar player than I was. <laughs> but I'm like to me, like I was just moving my fingers around and it didn't make sense. But like growing up, listening to bands like Sonic Youth, I'm like, no, this is the way the song goes. Like 
It doesn't make sense to you because you're trying to play a major, but this note right here is what makes it cool. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to teach it to him. I'm like, I get what you're saying because it makes sense, but like to me, it's like this this ugly note. This is what makes the well, song. And those are cool moments, like when you're working with a really good producer because they're surrounded by music all day long. That's not your music, so they come out with different ears, and they're like, I know what you're trying to do. This is what you're trying to do, and this is what you should be doing. And you're like, okay, yeah, I get it. And I think yeah. that's like. When, when you're talking about like working with Tom on it, he he's coming at it like, oh, that's not right. And if you just had that third person with you to be like, this is what you guys mean. And that's like, yeah. those are one of those like beautiful things of like working with somebody who's not in the band because they're impartial to it. They don't have yeah. any fucking like uh, ego in it. So you, they can you, tell you right away. And and those are the people, you know, that you got to trust for sure. You know, it's like. Uh, that's why you're paying them. Yeah. But they, but it's still like, the, that's why you go to certain people because like, their opinions mean something like a lot of times, you know, it's like, you know, when Steve was in the band, like our, our personalities, as far as like music writing, were definitely different, you know? So it's like, uh, when someone in the band says something, it's one thing, but like when a producer that you, you know, I guess you trust his ear and they're like, Oh, maybe this doesn't work. Then it's like, all right, fine. But well, that's what, that's what, that's what starts to happen, man. I mean, like we've now worked with John DeClario on the last two releases, and Norm only wants to go with him. And I want to work with other people. Mm. And I love John, but I, we've already worked with him twice. So it'd be nice to see who pulls something out of us. When we work with Pete from the Bouncing Souls, we got a very, we got some things that we like, he, that he pulled out of us differently. And John knows now, like, where are my voices, what I can do, what we're going for, and like, can get the best something out of us. You know, and it's easy to and comfortable. And that's why a lot of people go back to the same producers and studios, you know, but we've already did it. And it, and so I'm always like, well, let's work with somebody else. Like who's who's cool and different to work with and that we can afford and like be worth doing just for the new experience of doing it. And so that's kind of tough because, you know, Norm will be like, oh, I, you know, like we're going back to John because he can get the best drum sounds and gets the best vocal takes and knows what we're going for with harmonies. I'm like, yeah, but we already did it. Like, let's go do something with somebody else. Cause like, maybe they'll get something else because it'll only make us better. Like we've already gotten the, the, that producer's point of view on our music. I'm, I'm with you. And I'm also with, with Norm on this though. You know, like I, I could see it both ways, man. Cause sometimes I see I, it both ways. I yeah, definitely do. <clears throat> you know, cause you're just like, it's like, yeah, I, I get it. It's like you, you like the comfortability of being like, okay. You know, cause we've gone back to the same people a few times, but uh, r right now we have like a three man rotation. So, yeah, and I, I think I think that's I think they're both great. I think because you're comfortable, you can get the best out of what you're looking to do. And it's also like they they know when you need a break or what you need and and they know how they operate. And so when you go with somebody new, it was kind of like a, you know, a feeling out process in, and you might not get what you want out of it or what you thought you could get out of it, you know. So I don't know. It's one of those things that it's like adding a member to your band. It um, is. It is. That's, that's what it is. I mean, it's, yeah, you're adding a member that you have to basically trust because if you don't trust someone's ear or their ability, then it's like anything that they suggest. It's like, you know, at a certain point, it's like, Oh, just hit the red button and let us figure it out. Right. And so, you know, with fires forming, even though we did it with John, he kind of knew that we were like going on like a different journey of things when it came to like writing. And so it does sound a little bit like sleepwalk, but they definitely sound like two very different releases. I think so. Uh, yeah. just songwriting wise, it's a mm. completely kind of different way of looking at things. Um, and I think that's just like pushing us. So now with two new guys in the band, I can only assume that like it would be different even if we went back to John because there's two new guys in the band. So we'll see. We're going to start once everybody's in the COVID clear, cause we all got COVID um, we will uh, resume writing and doing uh, we're, our, our plan is to demo shit. Uh, we've never done it before. So we're going to demo things. Cause why the fuck not? We never play shows in the winter at this point, unless it's a cool show or whatever that means. But who wants to travel? We did one tour in the middle of February once and it was, it was a blizzard the whole time. Oh, so fuck that. <laughs> yeah. It was us, uh, Johnny Madcap and the distractions from California and the scandals. And, uh, we did 10 days and the snow followed us the whole time. So it was a fucking disaster. So now because of that, we never play shows in February. So we might as well just take this COVID time or whatever time it is and just fucking really like work on music and like, and, and do it. And, uh, I think the difference is, is, 
instead of like rewriting things a bunch of times, I think it's more like, let's just write it. And if it sounds good, like fucking let's demo it out and write to it, like mute, like write vocals and shit to it and lyrics and just like leave it as is until a producer gets to it. Like, let's not rewrite something for a year because that's what happens with a lot of stuff. And no, I, you- <laughs> I, hate, yeah. I fucking I hate when bands are like, we're working on this record for five years. Like, who cares? Yeah. Like, you yeah. already probably ruined the song at this point. <laughs> It is. There's something about the song when it first gets done and comes out where you're just like, okay, that's the magic. And then from there, it's like, oh, I don't really like this chord in the verse. I'm like, oh, maybe I should change the melody in this. Like, yeah, now like that. No, you got to do it. You got to write it down like normal rewrite drums a hundred times. And it's like, we got to get to the studio because you're going to rewrite it. And the first time was the best time you did it. You know, same thing yeah. with same thing with melodies, you know, and anything like that. It's like because just because you got demo itis and you're bored of it doesn't mean it wasn't bad. Yeah. It, just, or it doesn't mean it wasn't good. I mean, good. it's like yeah, you yeah. could you you just did it to death. You know, you need to like I want to just write shit, fucking demo it and move on and then let it sit there until it's time to really record it and don't go back to it. You know, even if you have to relearn how to play it, let a producer hear it and be like, hey, you should do this instead before you get so married to it because you've like rehearsed it every fucking week at practice, you know, just so you don't forget it. If you would just demo it out, you won't forget it. It'll just be somewhere, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's we, you know, uh, we started doing that, um, you know, not as much as we should. But yeah, like once once you go to practice and, and you could like sit on certain things because there's been times we get to the studio and I'm like, oh, that's what you were playing. I'm like, that doesn't even work. <laughs> 100 percent. Right? Exactly. You're, so you like, don't you don't hear it. Like I'm like sitting there trying to like play the right chords and sing the right words. Dude, we do, we had a whole song that we thought was the best song we ever wrote. <laughs> yes, I know. And then we got to the fucking studio and the producer was like, what is this? This is the this is your chorus. This is your verse. And you have them reversed. And this intro thing is your chorus. All right. Which one? Which one of the five is it? Tell me. Hey, Nora. OK, so hey, yeah. Nora. That that nin, 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 intro was the intro and then it kicked into this like um, the end of the very end of Hey, Nora, the bass line goes like boop, boo, do, 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 do. It's very like the cure. It has like this like uh, close to me kind of cure sure. thing going on. And it was like a guitar thing that was like and the hey nora please help me that was over that and that was basically the verse the verse i knew you were gonna say that yeah okay and then after that it kicked into the the dance beat that dance beat and that dance beat was like a musical break there was nothing over that it was just and i'm just thinking in my head this is a big rock out part and just over and over getting beaten to my head by the producer. Like, why are there not vocals over this? There's too much just music. It's not like you're playing a guitar solo. There's nothing interesting happening. Yeah, it's a cool like disco dance beat, but like there's nothing here. This should be your chorus. And we had sang on it and did this and he took it and fucking Frankenstein it. And he goes, this is the song. And we just stood there like our fucking heads exploded. <laughs> and we were like, what? And we had a writer transition part, right? We had a writer transition part and then rewrite the verses and the, co- the, the fast, the, the choruses got sang over the fast part or the verses became the chorus. It was a whole thing. That's and I crazy. was like, fuck, like yeah. our best song just got ruined. And now I feel like we have nothing on this record because yeah. this was the single in my mind. And then we, re- we rewrote it and he hacked it up as, and when we came back to it within like an hour, we were like, this is way better. Way better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. That's all. Yeah, that song's great, man. A perfect first single for sure. But like nothing really changed. It was literally just like moved around. Yeah. It's really weird. Yeah, like, no, no. And- Sometimes you need like you need that. Like I, you know, like you you record something and three years later, like I could listen to some songs. I'm like, I don't know why I did that there. And it's like if somebody told me that three years ago and r- mixed it around then you know, then we would have recorded it differently. But I mean, once you get, you know, it's once you write as many songs or you've been doing it for so long, it's like you feel like no one could tell you shit or or you feel not that no one could tell you shit, but that if it sucks, you're the guy who's going to make it suck. Okay, you're like, right. If it's going to suck, I don't care. I'm going to write it because it's like, you know, and it's funny because during the pandemic, I started like a side band. Um, Oh, yeah. You told me yeah, with the with the old jukebox guys, with all the old jukebox guys, with well, Seth and Mike and then. My buddy, John Boy, who was in this band called Phone Home, 
Uh, they were like a two piece, like instrumental band. He plays drums, but he was also in my band before jukebox. And then Joey college, our original jukebox drummer. Yeah, his, Joey college. His brother is in this side band chopper. Chopper. Uh, yeah. Johnny Giovanni was his stage name for a while. And basically chopper, Seth and Mike and Joe, our original drummer, they were a band before jukebox. And basically it, jukebox was them, me and Chris Schultz when we started the band. Anyway, so we started this side band and it's the most serious, not serious side project I've ever seen because everybody is bringing heat and I'm bringing a lot of like rejected jukebox songs or songs that like I think didn't work or needed different ears on. And every song we write is fucking killer. And it breaks my heart because we'll practice like once a month. Everybody's got kids or can't tour. And the yeah. goal is the goal is to like play one killer show or be the best local band ever. And like, <laughs> and like, dude, they, it's serious. Like people want to dress similar, certain lighting on stage, like, and be very serious about it. But it's also like the most for fun band as possible. And nobody is allowed to get mad at people when they either can't make practice or they're not there. I mean, we have fucking three guitar players. So like, who cares, you know, but like every there's three guitars, there's, there's two singers or, and everybody else can sing like me and chopper will mainly sing. And the songs we wrote are fucking insane. And I'm like, man, if only I can do this with jukebox this easily because everybody's bringing heat and everybody's ideas are insane. And I was like, man, that should have been a jukebox song. Cause I wrote something like that was like, this is like the best song I wrote in years. And it's with this side band. That's not going to do anything with it. Yeah. But once we record it, I, I'm like, oh man, people are going to really like these songs. I'm like really excited about it. Uh, so anybody listening, be on the lookout for Friday night vampires in 2022. Oh, so you guys are, um, how many songs are you going to record? Right now we have five songs and about 25 covers. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the covers? Dude, I mean, that's why it started, man. It literally started as like a pandemic band. Like we got into a studio and we just wanted to hang out and play music. Hang out. Yeah. yeah. And just because like we all love each other and we all love playing music together. And some of us never played music together. I never played music with Chopper. I hadn't played with John Boy in over 15 years. And then I hadn't played with Mike and Seth since they were in Jukebox. And yeah. I really miss them being in the band. You know, anybody who's ever been in a Jukebox, you know, the besides Chris, Anybody who left was because of like a point in their life where it just the band wasn't conducive to their life anymore. Yeah. And the priorities shifted. And don't get me wrong. Like I have a child now. My priorities have shifted, but the band has shifted in a way that was like we're not touring 250 days a year anymore anyway. But back in 2014 and 15, we were. So if you weren't on that train, then you needed to get off. And everybody yeah. was under and everybody understood that when people left, they were like leaving because they didn't want to do it anymore or they couldn't do it anymore or they were you know, tired of the road. And it was all like with love and understood, you know, when, when the Bob situation happened, I think it was just like um, just a real toxic environment that needed to stop. And now our friendship is entirely way better than it was when he was in the band, at least for the last three years. So like with these dudes and the Friday night vampires, we all loved playing music together and never, never not loved playing music together and we loved writing together and we loved the process and everybody loves a different part of the process there are hardcore songwriters in there there are hardcore recording people in there and there's hardcore fucking entertainers in there between chopper and i at fucking love to entertain so the shit is just fucking really intense and epic and if and and the thing is like nobody wants to spend any money on it but if we if, if we went to a, a producer like a john declario the shit would be fucking insane and I never talk anything up because I'm very self-deprecating, but like the music I'm writing with them, I, I wish I was doing it with jukebox because it's fucking insane. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, yeah, Cause it, it's fucking, there's some cool shit. Something to look forward to for sure. Um, now, just before I let you go, um, you know, let's shift gears for a second here. Uh, what are some movies that you got to watch this month for Christmas that you want to, you want to spit out, man. What, what are some Ooh. what are some gems that, that you got to to watch in quarantine? Gems. So I just watched Bad Santa for the first time last oh, night. Oh, really? That movie's so good. I didn't like it. <laughs> I saw that shit in theaters and I was like, Thurman Merman was my shit. I get it. I think I needed to see it back then. OK, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was very 2003 and in the best way possible. I was also seeing it with my with my my partner and she was not into it. So um uh, <laughs> 
Um, so I watched that. Uh, and let's see other Christmas movies. I just saw the Black Christmas remake, the 2019 one. Uh, okay. I did. I, I I tried to watch it. So my relationship it's on HBO Max. It's, yeah, it's yeah. I tr- I tried. <laughs> my <laughs> relationship. Uh, I remember watching 74 and thinking, okay, this is kind of boring. I remember watching 2006's Black Xmas and thinking this is the greatest horror movie of all time. <laughs> and then I remember trying to watch 2019's Black Christmas and thinking like, I don't know what's going on here. And I, 30 minutes in, I was like, I, I wish them well, but I, I bailed. OK, so I liked it a lot. I liked, okay. I think I liked it better than 74. I think people like romanticize 74. They do. Yeah. And I, I think it's great. Same thing with like Silent Night, Deadly Night. Love that movie. Oh, they Definitely romanticize it. But that happens with a lot of movies, like a lot of old movies, too. Like it's classic because it's like the first of its time or first of its kind in a certain time. And some things definitely hold up. Like like if we're talking about like romanticizing movies like that, like Alien, Jaws, like these movies deserve to be romanticized. Those are yeah, Halloween. Yeah, those Halloween. Are, yeah, those are you know, classics. I think Friday I, the 13th, you know, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like these, there's reasons why these things are like romantic. E- e- even even Friday the 13th, like the older I get, the more like the original, like I, I compare it to Sleepaway Camp. And I think Sleepaway Camp is a better movie than the totally. original Friday the 13th. Better twist, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it. I'm a, yeah. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of uh, I don't mind spoiling things. That's a, that. And that's an old movie. That's that if you haven't seen it, that is the, yeah. the best spoil ever. That's it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I remember watching it and being like, wait, what? <laughs> so, you know what I did watch that's not in the horror realm of things? I watched the new Matrix movie. Me too. I watched it last night. So, and I don't know when this is, episode is going to come out. So, I don't want to. Really I'm going to put it out anything. Monday. Okay. I'm not going to spoil anything. So, but neither, I, will, yeah. I will say this. I rewatched all of them recently leading up to this. And the first movie. It very much holds up and it's yep. very much a 1999 movie. The second movie has parts of it that are OK. It's an action movie. It gets a little, you know, into itself, but it's still like the Matrix. The third one is two different movies put together and just a weird sci fi war that just is, looks like shit on the screen. And also just like kind of a boring letdown. It has that first half of that movie where Neo is at the train station, like lost in in like purgatory kind of thing. Great idea. And that's kind of what they did with the new one. The first half is like this really meta, really trying to be like in on itself. And I get it. There are so many different levels of Matrix fans. There's the people who just saw the movies. There's the people who saw the movies, played the video game or the comic books, the Animatrix. They're in it. They're in the world. They have this whole theory of whatever. And if you're really in on it, you're going to love it because yep. that's just how anything goes. Yep, yep, if, you're, yep. if you're really in on something, then you're going to love whatever fan service you get. That's why Star Wars is Star Wars. Like if you're really into something, you're going to find something that you love about it. But if you are like the average casual, I've seen all of these and I appreciate them or like them viewer, there there is so much valid hate for the new Matrix movie. <laughs> <laughs> because like, it's just silly at times. And I'm all for meta shit. But like the casting is brutal at times. Like I, I fucking hate Neil Patrick Harris in this movie and his character is what it is and what his role is, is fine. But like, it's just silly. And there's a lot of silly shit. The action isn't that good in the movie. Um, the love story, like the two of them have such good chemistry and their love story is trampled by poor writing <laughs> and, and just like, uh, I and, and people who know me personally, I have a strong hate for Will Smith. I I think Will Smith, um, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, Bad Boys, Independence Day are fucking amazing pieces of fucking art. Everything else he does, I kind of fucking hate because he Will Smith's it. Jada Pinkett Smith in this movie is fucking unbearable in the Matrix movie. I didn't she even is, know she was in it. Is she the she older plays lady? N- Niobe? Ni- the, okay, all right then. Yeah, fucking you- misery. She's okay. acted poorly. Terrible makeup. Just like. Ugh. I, I didn't even get that. I was like, for a second there, I was like, that looks like Jada. Uh, and then I remembered the old character thinking like, well, was that her in the, like, did she play the old character? Yes. And so, and, and, and this is what happens with a movie like The Matrix. Wow. Um, 
there are so many different ways you can go with the matrix. It's a beautiful universe and a great idea. But the problem with that being so open-ended, there are no rules. So when there are no rules, you can very much let the fucking like the, like you can, you know, the, the inmates run the asylum. If there's no rules, you can literally have writers fucking up a movie, just like they were kind of talking about in the meta of the beginning of the movie. So it was clear that one of the sisters, the Wachowski sisters, is not involved in it at all. Yeah. You know, because somebody was telling me that the studio was going to make the movie regardless without them. So one of them was like, all right, well, at least let's put our spin on it because it's our baby. So I get that. But certain things like it was did not need to be made. And that's all I'll say when it comes to like Matrix four. Yeah, I. um, Wow. Let's see. I hated the casting on certain people where I was just like this. This was there a need to have a Morpheus there? <laughs> I don't even know. But it's like, was Larry Fishburne just completely not available? Like, I don't understand. Like what, what he must have been like, he's doing blackish. That's about it. If he was around for the movie, it might have been better. I wish he was in it. I didn't really comprehend what was going on, why he wasn't the oh, same dude, character. They, they Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, they explained Neil- the Morpheus character in such a quick way that my mind was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, like, I really needed to. I, I think it might be worth a second watch, but I don't think it deserves me to give it a second watch. So, yeah, I I love the first one. Two and three were like this blur that I I, I, don't, I have no urge to rewatch. I was just like I saw them in the theater. I, yeah, I did, too. I, I was happy to rewatch them this week when I was quarantined. And I, I, I remember I, why I remember why I didn't like them. I got the um, I went to YouTube and got like the quick like a uh, synopsis. Like 20 minute. Yeah. yeah. Like a, so 20 minute, you know, just yeah. just just to 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 get it, you know, fresh in my head. And then I liked. Yeah, it's just there's some things that worked, you know, some some of the, you know, the the fanfare for sure connected with me on this movie. I didn't hate it, but. Yeah, they was just like by the end, I was just thinking like, uh, I mean, OK, I get it. That's fine. It wasn't like, yeah, I, I can't spoil it, obviously. So I'm just going to say like uh, I, I thought it was good, but it wasn't anything that uh, blew me away. I thought it had potential. Uh, the things that worked really worked about it. I love Carrie Ann Moss and uh, Keanu. I think that they're the best part of the movie. Um and that's about it, really, you know, like it just uh, I think people are going to knock it regardless because it's on HBO Max and most people have HBO, um, you know, when it comes to, to to streaming things, you know, like you could just put it up on TV. I, I'm a I'm a theater person. I still go to the movies. I think I would have hated that movie if you saw it in the theater. No, no. But you would have gone to see it in the theater. One hundred percent. I would have gone to see it if I didn't. If I wasn't sick, I probably would have went to go. Yeah, I would have gone like what I'm saying is the people that actually would go pay to go see it. Those are the people whose opinions I want to hear from. Everyone else is like, oh, let me just put on HBO and I hear this Matrix thing. And I that some people probably didn't even watch the first three. They're probably like, oh, yeah, let me just watch. Yeah, I mean, that's what happened. I mean, the same thing happened with like Dune. You know, I think that was a movie that was like specifically important to see in the theater. Yeah. You know, and I'm not a huge Dune person, but I, I but if I just watched it on HBO, I can see being like, yeah, it was whatever. Certain things. I'm a theater person, just like you. Like I'm I'm waiting to see licorice pizza. Like that's what I'm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to see that. Uh, what else did I see this week that I want, wanted to see? Um, there's something that what's that new movie out that's like Mars Attacks, like where there's every actor is in it. It's on Netflix. Oh, just, uh, don't look up. Don't look up. People are saying that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta so watch that. I'm gonna watch that. There's, so, I've been, I've been crushing like every documentary possible. I watched all the music documentaries on HBO. I didn't. Oh, we talked about Juice World via text. I didn't get a chance yeah. to watch that yet. The Kenny no. G one was fire. Yeah, I heard it was. It was great. I didn't. You know, I guess it was just like an. You no, know what one. the Kenny G one, especially for like listeners of this podcast, like, wow, what yeah. an interesting person. Okay, it's like super unlikable, super likable. At the same time, I've never <laughs> met somebody who was like, man, I totally love their attitude and fucking hate their attitude. Like, whereas I could see some people being like DMX. <laughs> yeah, I could see how people could be down on people who are very positive mental attitude people and work ethic people. Look like someone like myself who carries himself pretty positive a lot of time. A lot of people can find that graining. But Kenny G 
has this positive mental attitude, but with an air of arrogance on it. Oh, wow. But I got like, it. Yeah. But like, he's so good at his instrument. He's like, I'm the best because I practice more than everybody. I still practice five hours a day. I never practice five hours a day, anything in my life. Yeah. So like, so like I get it, but like, he's also super self-aware of what makes him likable and hateable. So it's interesting. And he comes from a world like punk rock where he is fucking hated in the jazz world, but he is in theory, the most popular jazz player <laughs> of the last 30, yeah. 40 years. You people say Kenny G and like everyone knows exactly what the, like, the, the, yeah, it's, it's and it's if you don't know, which is what happened the other day when we were at band practice, somebody in our band didn't know who Kenny G was. I played Kenny G and they said, oh, I know that. I'm like, yeah, because <laughs> his great. music exists in yeah. the zeitgeist of, of the matrix of our world. That's right. You know? Every you know, ele- every elevator on the planet, probably any store during any holiday season. Yeah. You know, that fucking high pitched saxophone sound because yeah. he plays it like he, like, you know, the way Jimi Hendrix plays guitar or, you know, like he plays his instrument like he plays it. So, you know, purists are going to be like, oh, he's bastardizing whatever he's doing. But like, clearly he's doing something right. The guy sold like gazillions of records. So and- who am I to say? You know, I always say I always say the same thing. I'm like, who the fuck am I? I'm going to work Monday. I don't know what he's doing. Probably. Yeah, not. exactly. <laughs> um, any other good movies that I saw? I need to still see Ghostbusters. Didn't I get saw to see that. I wanted to see that in the theater. I did get to, you know, I have a newborn. So getting out to the theater is tough, especially like the Alamo used to have baby days where you can bring your baby and your baby was allowed to make noise and cry and do whatever. But with COVID, they don't do it anymore, which is understandable. Sure. Um, but I didn't see new Ghostbusters. And I really need to see that. Oh, and I haven't seen Spider-Man yet. And I, uh, and I, I don't know if I believe Spider-Man is worth as great as everybody makes it out. Everyone. I, I, I'm not much into comic book stuff, but like everyone is like masturbating over that movie. Every post I see is like, oh, my God, that was so good. So, you know, I don't know. Can it be great. that good? I don't know. I mean, I know the last I, thing that people jerked off that hard about that was the best thing ever was Stranger Things. And everybody was correct about it. How can and that's a series. I don't know how a movie can be that generally loved. I mean, is it that great? Like, I don't know. Like tra- the trailer looked cool, even for like someone like me, where I'm like, I don't give a shit. But like I saw. The yeah, trailer, I don't I give a like, fuck. I lo- I'm a comic book person. I don't really give a fuck about comic book movies like Marvel shit. Don't give a fuck about it. I've seen all the movies. I'm kind of like, you know, I don't watch all the shows. You know, some of them I do, but it's another one of those things like The Matrix. If you're really into it, you're going to enjoy it. If you're not, you know, you it's you know, it's you can I feel like you should be able to. And I think Marvel does this really well. And I think it's too it, The Matrix didn't do it well. If you are a, if you if your movie is super well made, then a casual viewer can enjoy it the same way like a hardcore fan could. And I think that's kind of how Star Wars is looked at. You know, I feel like most like normies can enjoy Star Wars at the surface level. And then if you're a hardcore fan, you can get so much out of it. And I think Marvel does that really well. So I'm assuming that's kind of how Spider-Man probably is, you know, whereas if you're a super fan, you're going to find all this shit to jizz over. And if you are just a a casual fan like me who loves Spider-Man, I've seen all the movies, you know, I've read comic books. But I'm not like, you know, deep in the, the, the world of it. I'll probably enjoy the shit out of it. And I think that's w- great filmmaking because you can enjoy it on all surface levels, uh, whether no matter how deep your fandom goes. And it's tough to do that. Um, and, and, and I think the Matrix falls short of that, whereas these other movies that we're talking about kind of nail it. You know, well, I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to say, you know, we already discussed uh, speaking of movie magic. Uh, so our next episode, we're going to do our favorite movies and, and albums and all that shit of the year. I have to get it down to like 10 movies. Um, I think. Yeah. I what do you got this year coming up? Like what's on like what's in, not in order, but what's in your list this year? Oh, a bunch of shit. Uh, yeah. I mean, Any it, de- a deep cuts? Anything good? Uh, so I'll, 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 you know, for anyone. It's a li- weird year for movies. For anyone listening. Uh, like you know, what's coming up in the episode after this that people should be like, oh, maybe I should watch that movie before Sam unleashes his list. Uh, let me see. Let me, let, let me just try to pull it up here. Um, I, I'm going to give a couple of movies and I'm not going to give the order, but uh, no, no order. I'm going to say um, Slumber Party Massacre. The, the remake? Night, the Night House. Bloody oh, Hell. Okay. 
And I'm going to say, I'm going to leave it with uh, Last Night in Soho. I knew you were going to say fucking Last Night in Soho. <laughs> because the movie magic to that, like aside from like the story, which we discussed was the weakest part of it. There was just something about this movie that was just such a like cinematic universe. You know, it was oh, just like, yeah, it yeah. was this thing where it was like, this is a. <clears throat> This is a movie with a soundtrack and and casting and outfits. Yeah, and but like, that dude who made that movie, Edgar Wright. Yeah, I mean, he knows how to put music to film. That's what like, I'm saying. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. like, like uh, he did Baby Driver, right? He did Baby Driver. Amazing. Baby Driver. That might have been his best. But I see why people don't like that movie. But I, 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 he is so good at putting music to film, and it makes total sense. And uh, and he and he creates a universe. And I think Scott Pilgrim. Yes. I think another movie with a crazy soundtrack. Um, the soundtrack to this movie of Soho doesn't really take away from the movie. It creates the environment, the lighting, uh, the effects. I think this move that movie was beautiful, and uh, and there, there there's a couple things about it that I didn't like, but I think that's definitely uh, for anybody who's going to listen to uh, Sam's next episode with with his year enders. Uh, I would watch Last Night in Soho out of all those lists, but I need to see Slumber Party. I didn't know that they remade it. They did. And it's like, man, let me tell you. Um, and I didn't see the Nighthouse either. Uh, Nighthouse. I mean, I'll get into it, but mind blowing. But I'm okay. going to say the Slumber Party Massacre remake had no business being that good. Like it didn't even make sense. It was it's it's kind Is it of on Shutter. It's on. Uh, God, it's I'll on, find it's it. on the sci fi channel. What? <laughs> yeah, that's the that was the exclusive rights. Um, it, it's kind of it was like, made for TV. Yeah, it was. black. Wow. It, it's like Black Xmas, basically, where it's like you have the source material, but then they added and then it was just like this whole other thing that made it amazing. Like, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this doesn't even make sense. Like, it's no it's so ridiculous that this movie that for the most part is kind of a terrible movie but it was like a great 80s slasher mm -hmm. um i couldn't believe it i'm like watching it going like that's so smart this is so smart all this stuff's so smart but um damn cool. listen cool. i gotta yo, see it thanks for hanging out with me oh Dude, i'm glad we finally did it i know man uh much love to you talented songwriter uh you know when we first met uh certain people you know the game day regulars were another like Whenever you play shows with certain people, you gravitate towards them because you're like, oh, these guys are not like pretentious dicks and they're super cool and they're pretty normal and you could talk to them and they're not like, you know, fucking like trying to climb a mountain of like, you know, clout. Yeah. <laughs> you or know? Not even that. It's like sometimes sometimes talking to people and it's like fucking like I feel like I got like a chit. You got to get a chisel out to like just get to talk to them. Just like yeah, yeah, yeah. say hello. Yeah. And, that, and then usually it's just because they're shy. <laughs> yeah, know, that's what it is. May, may, maybe so. Maybe so. You know, but like we always gravitated towards you guys and, uh, you know, you guys continue to basically wow us with everything that you put out. And uh, man, much love to you. Uh, much love to you. Thank you for doing the show. And uh, I'll talk to you in two seconds when I jump off. Peace. Later, man. Peace.